Hello Warfighters, War is Hell. Today we're going to be answering the question, what guided Soviet military thinking during the Cold War? Before I get to the answer to that question, I do want to thank everybody who's supporting me through this project and through these videos. It means a lot. If you are able to support uh, financially here to kind of help out with books and tuition, there is a link in the description below. This is academic research that I am doing for school. Uh, so your donations really goes to help out with my own education and the hope is that we can get enough money to do some more advanced research. Like I would love to be able to go to Estonia and Poland and kind of research what their militaries have done since the fall of the Soviet Union and how things have changed, for example. Uh, so if you can help out, it really does go a long way. Now, a lot of what we're going to be getting from this particular video does come from the book Soviet Military Strategy in Europe, written by Joseph D. Douglas Jr. This book was originally written in 1980, which first was kind of a turnoff for me because with the fall of the Soviet Union and Glasnost uh, just a little bit before that, there was a lot of great information that the West was able to obtain that they didn't have previously. It was either secret or whatever. Uh, but it great or it gave great insight on what the Soviet Union was doing for its military and some of the why behind some of the things that NATO was seeing. Now with this book being written in 1980, they didn't have access to that, but uh, Joseph D. Douglas Jr. does a great job of making use of what was available to him at the time. Looking at things like the Soviet Officer's Handbook and having that translated into English and using that into some of his own research. Plus. A cool thing for me is I'm a big alternate history guy, so with uh, Abel Archer having uh, or would take place three years later, it is interesting to see what people thought would have happened uh, at that time if the Soviet Union would have attacked NATO during Abel Archer. Anyway, that being said, let's go ahead and just dive right into it because to understand Soviet military thinking, Joseph D. Douglas Jr. does a great job, I think, at getting at the core of the answer to this question, which is setting the first part of his book aside to really talk about the relationship between the Soviet Union, communism, and warfare as a whole, and the role that each of these things would play and how they relate to one another. So understanding Soviet military doctrine, you do have to therefore have some idea of the thinking and ideals of Marxism-Leninism, which was the flavor of communism for the Soviet Union. In some ways, and I know this probably kind of throw a little people, uh, throw some people off here. The idea of communism, to some degree, sounds similar to a theocracy or maybe even a uh, religious extremist point of view. Because with communism, they basically had this mentality that they were right. They were the only source of truth, and that everybody must have this. Uh, that this will spread throughout the globe one day, and it's their mission to bring this to everybody. And so from that perspective, war was definitely a tool in which to do this, because it was the next stage of human evolution, the Soviet Union thought. You know, there was feudalism, and people progressed to capitalism after that point, the highest form of which was imperialism. And now here comes communism's uh, job to, to basically fill in the gap as people would go from... Uh, capitalism to socialism and the highest form of that being communism and then that would eventually progress onto an anarchy uh an anarchic society because people would need to govern themselves anymore thanks to communism uh Clausewitz is known for saying that war is a continuation of policy by other means lenin took this to the extreme He's quoted saying a number of times, war is a continuation of policy by other means, which is very, very similar. But it was his ideals that basically guided the Soviet Union to believe that warfare was an instrument of politics and that it was needed to be able to bring their political will to the rest of the world. There's this quote here that comes from Marxism-Leninism on war and army. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read this to you. It says, the types of war in our time are determined by the main lines taken by the social struggle. These lines are the struggle between the two world social systems, socialism and capitalism, the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie, the general democratic struggle of the popular masses against monopoly associations, the national liberation struggle of the peoples against the colonialists, the struggle between capitalist countries for strengthening the uh, positions of monopoly capital, 
The main decisive line of the social struggle is the struggle between socialism and imperialism. Now, because the Soviet Union believed that war was a means in which to spread communism and was a tool that could be used for political purposes, in the mindset of the Soviet Union, war is politics. Now, if there was a mission statement, you know, like some businesses and organizations have a mission statement, this would basically be what would be the mission statement of the Soviet Union to go ahead and bring communism to the world by force if necessary. Now, they thought it was efficient because war could expedite the transition of people from a capitalist society to a communist society. Uh, and this is what they could use as an efficient way to bring people into the fold of communism because if people wouldn't join them, they would eliminate them. And in some cases, that would use or utilize less resources, less time than trying to go through some more covert ways. The Soviet Union obviously used covert ways to try and uh, influence people into the realm of communism, uh, but they were willing to use some more overt ways too. Now, with that mindset though, that they're supposed to be spreading communism throughout the entire globe, you're looking at a military strategy that is very offensive in nature. If your goal is to spread, you have to be on the attack. It does you no good to sit there and be on the defensive. So as we go through some of these other uh, questions and these other videos, this offensive nature of warfare for the Soviet Union is going to play a big part. And that is because of this founding principle of uh, Marxism Leninism, that it is their job to spread this throughout the globe. Of course, the United States, NATO, the primary adversaries of the Soviet Union understood this very well. The Senate Committee on International Relations said this in 1978. They said it must be seen that socialism's military might objectively assist the successful deployment of the revolutionary liberation movements and that it hinders the exportation of imperialist counter-revolution. In this lies on the most important manifestations of the external function of the armed forces of the socialist state. So the most important manifestations of the external function of the armed forces of the Soviet state was probably the most correct thing here. That This is why the Soviet Union figured they needed to have a military for their defense to some degree, but really to use this as their political tool. Because this is a struggle in the mindset of the Soviet Union between socialism, communism, and capitalism, this went beyond the US or NATO. But of course, these were the two parties that were pr uh, principally responsible for defending uh, democracy and capitalism. And this is why that these uh, nations were seen as the adversary to the Soviet Union in their eyes. A lot of the strategies that we'll see from the Soviet Union and also from NATO really took a lot of uh, the neutrality of countries into account, not because they should be the exceptions to what's going on in a particular area, that they would be excluded from war, but because the Soviet Union, they believed in the West, would not have any regard for a country's neutrality during war. Because if they're not welcoming communism, they're enemies at that point. So that's another thing that, of course, it'll be very interesting for us to analyze a little bit as we go on. Because of this offensive nature and the mission of the Soviet Union to spread communism throughout the entire globe, the idea of the domino effect that we hear about during Korea and Vietnam, that if one country falls, others will, definitely did have some merit. Because if the Soviet Union was successful in going ahead and taking one country and bringing them into their fold, they could learn from that and keep doing that again and again and again, increasing their influence. And so NATO in the United States definitely felt like that the best way to counter these aggressive tactics was to basically fight fire with fire, that they would fight to the bitter end and through violence, if necessary, resist communist influence in these areas. So that puts a lot of things into perspective about the Cold War. And it helped me understand some things a lot more, understanding where communism kind of plays a role into Soviet military thinking. Now, it also helped me understand the Soviet mindset on nuclear war a little bit. We're going to go more in depth with this in, in a few other videos here, but it is important to know that nuclear war, as far as the Soviet Union saw it, again, was a tool for them 
to grow their influence and to bring people into the fold of communism. So they were definitely willing to use nuclear weapons if that was going to be the way that they could uh, spread communism the most effectively. Mutually assured destruction was hands down one of the most important factors in preventing the Cold War from going hot. Because when you have this mindset of the Soviet Union to spread communism throughout the globe, again, as part of their mission statement, there's almost like this sacred duty to protect communism. Uh, since they are the only people who, quote, quote, had this understanding uh, and had to share it with the world, it is their responsibility to also protect it. The Soviet Union knew that if they were to launch a strike against the United States or NATO, that there would be a full retaliatory strike on the Soviet Union that would utterly destroy the communist uh, establishment in the Soviet Union, and therefore that progress would be stopped. That human evolution that they believed was to occur across the world would therefore not happen. And so that did a lot to really cause the Soviet Union a lot of pause uh, with what they were going to do. Because they did, again, have a different mindset with nuclear war. In the West, it was seen as the end. If we got to that point, everything is lost, we're done. But the Soviet Union saw it as a thing that you escalate to. It was one of the core aspects of their military strategy, and in some respects was the most important part of their strategy uh, during the 60s especially. It's where they put most of their focus and development was into nuclear weapons, almost uh, going so far as to really let conventional military kind of go by the wayside in favor of nuclear. But anyway, like I said, we'll get to that here in a future video. But the USSR would do anything that they could to prevent these type of catastrophic wars. And prevention in the Soviet thinking is very different than what you would anticipate the West to prevent, uh, mean to prevent. Because to prevent for us means to avoid. And the way that the USSR would prevent warfare is one, being a military that was so powerful that no realistic government would challenge them. Uh, so we saw that too during the Cold War. There was a lot of instances where uh, the Soviet Union was, was very, very powerful and there was only one force that could really stand up to them, which was NATO. Um, so they were successful in that. It also meant to prevent a war. The USSR also meant that they would preempt a war by attacking an enemy to throw them off. And again, that goes very much with the type of tactics that the Soviet Union had. If they have an offensive mindset, well, letting somebody else attack them first really goes counter to everything that they had been thinking and what they've set up their military to do and the things that they've practiced. So to prevent a war, they were willing to do whatever uh, they needed to to be on the defensive. So that's why they would then go preempt it. And they would only engage in wars that they would deem beneficial or just in their mindset. And that basically means that they would only engage in warfare that was advantageous to them. Uh, they wouldn't get involved in, in other things that didn't have a real benefit for the Soviet Union. And so that was another way that they would prevent warfare was by analyzing what's in it for them. And that was another thing too, that with the Soviet Union, uh, the West definitely relied on was trying to figure out how did this benefit the Soviet Union? And that's one of the things that they would use to anticipate what they thought the Soviet Union was going to do. Again, another thing we'll be talking about in the near future. I do want to end with this quote here by Joseph D. Douglas Jr., the author of uh, the book that a lot of this came from. And this is how he summed everything up here towards, uh, or in the first chapter. He said, Soviet socialism is a world revolutionary force. World socialism directed from Moscow is the objective and the defeat of capitalism is the main means to that end. The objective is to be pursued actively using all means available. There can be no peace and no diminishing of goals until capitalism is destroyed. There can be no condemnation. The two social systems are opposed and irreconcilable. All actions and means in any form that further that objective are justified by Soviet ideology. Military force is a most essential tool to use in winning the struggle. Military superiority at all levels is a top priority. So with communism being such a factor, 
in the Soviet military thinking and their political mindset, this is going to really set the stage for a lot of the other things that we're going to be seeing. For example, in the next episode, we're going to be looking at how Soviet military strategy develops. So subscribe if you guys want to see when that video comes out. Like this video if you enjoyed what you saw. We do have a Discord where we do have a lot of great conversations. I'd love for you guys to be a part of it if you are not already. And again, if you can help support my education in making these videos, I would definitely appreciate it. It goes a long way. But that's going to be it here for this episode. War is hell. You don't have to worry because warfighters, I've got your six.